Romans chapter 16. I told our church this, and I don't mean to be overdramatic or anything um, arrogant in any way, but to me, this would have been, and it probably still is, the most important message that I'll ever preach. And as I was studying this, and as God was revealing some things through the scripture, it broke me to a point that it has changed, it's not only changed my life, but it's changed my ministry and changed the way that um, I not only respond to people's needs, but also the way I reflect upon myself. Because I truly have got a new revelation and a new revival of that God don't need me at all. And to be used of him is such a humbling thing and it's such an amazing thing. And I know, you all know my background, my mom and dad's here, my sister's here, my family's here. The heritage that I have, I'm sure you've heard it to your sick of it, as far as the wonderful heritage that God has blessed us with. But still yet, even with that advantage, I'm still amazed that God would still use me. And so I hope that maybe this is what I've studied is all just for me, but I pray this will be a revelation to you as well. Romans chapter 16 is, is, a, is, a, is a common trait with, with the, the writings of Paul and also the, the records of Paul. He's contributed to most of the New Testament as being the author of it. And you'll find that a lot of his uh, books, he spends some time showing appreciation to people that have meant a lot to him, specifically in the areas which he was ministering and being a missionary to. So Romans chapter 16 is pretty much what that is. But something really uh, struck out at me and really just jumped off the pages Verse 22 is where we will center in on tonight. And it says this, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. I'll repeat it again. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, we would read over this chapter. Some people would just skip it because he's just thanking people for what they've done to him and, and appreciation. And let me just say this. Take some time to thank the people that have been an influence in your life you'll find that uh, you may not have an opportunity to do so. So take the time to thank them because you never know what tomorrow's going to hold. Send that text message. Let them know how much you appreciate the influence they've been in your life. And Paul was taking time to do so. Jesus even showed appreciation to people that were uh, a help to him. But verse, if we read over this, you may not think anything of it, but verse 22, if you really read close, it says, who wrote this epistle? I just got through telling you that Paul is the author of Romans. And we, we know he is. But according to this passage in this text, he wasn't the writer of Romans. Now you say, well, you're contradicting yourself. I'm actually not. Paul's still the author, but Tertius was the scribe. There's actually a, um, a, an occupation in Roman times that was called an amanuensis. And an amanuensis was a hired uh, slave that was an intelligent slave. And basically they were scribes and they would be used not only by the apostle Paul, but also it was a common, uh, common occupation in those days. Because these, you know, there were a lot of people that maybe couldn't write. People that, that uh, had a hard time reading even. But Paul, of course, we know he was very intellectual and, and there are times when he did write his own letters. As, and you know, in Galatians, he said, I wrote this with my own hand. Right. And so we know that there are times that he did write his own letters. But in here, we, in Romans, it specifically says that this man, Tertius, was an amanuensis. This occupation was his to write word for word what Paul was saying. Now, as we look into his uh, life a little bit, we really don't know a lot about Tertius. And, and that seems to be commonplace. I was trying to look up some other famous amanuensis, and I don't know what the plural is, so I'll just say amanuensis. <laughs> but I was trying to, and there's really, they're, they're, they remain nameless. It wasn't like a, a, a job of high esteem. I mean, how would you like to sit there and listen to somebody and write what they say? 
Really? But that's what he did. But his name gives us a, a, a really good look into his life. His name means third. Tertius means third. If you ever have had an art class or you've studied the color wheel, you know there are primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. There are secondary colors. That's what those primary colors are mixed together. And then there's tertiary colors, which is the secondary colors mixed together. So that, that's where that comes from. Tertius means third. The implication is simply this. If it wasn't for Paul, we would have never known his name in the first place. He did not, Tertius mean third means he didn't want any attention drawn to him. But Paul, showing appreciation, said, you know what, Tertius, you've been here with me from Romans 1.1 to Romans 16.27, so why don't you take a moment, just a line, and put your name in there because you've been, you've been good to hang with me, so take the time to write your name. I want people to know that you took the time to write this book. And so if it wasn't for Paul, we wouldn't even know that Tertius was actually the scribe or the writer of the book of Romans. But listen, his name implies that he didn't even want to be mentioned in the first place. He just wanted to be the pen that Paul would use to record the book of Romans. He was satisfied with just being the instrument that Paul would use to write the book of Romans. And that's where my heart began to break. Because Tertius, he didn't want to be in the back, uh, up in the forefront. He would rather just be in the back. He didn't even want to be recognized. He wanted to remain nameless like all the other ones that, that were doing that same job. But listen, he was willing just to sit back and be the instrument that Paul would use to be the pen that Paul would use to write the book of Romans. And listen, folks, we have, and I have a greater desire more than I ever have had before just to be the pen that God would use to do his work. And listen, folks, when we understand he don't have to use us, it's an honor and a privilege. But listen, when we learn that he can use us, oh, why the world opens up to the Bible opens up to us just to know that we can be used of him what a blessing that is Amen. Amen. he was he was satisfied with just being the pen and my desire my my I guess it's a, a I don't even know if it's a challenge or a goal but my desire from now till God calls me home is just to be the pen right. just to be an instrument and so as this was progressing on and that, and, and that thought hit me and I thought, well, Lord, there's, and it still was just in there. If you're a preacher, you know what I mean. It's just something that's still in there but you haven't exhausted it yet. And I prayed to the Lord for wisdom. I was like, Lord, how do you want me to approach this? And he said, focus on the instrument. I said, okay. So I began to study an amanuensis and, and, and the instruments they would use, remember, Remember now, as we go through the rest of this message, we are the instrument. We are the pen, right? We, we, we should want to be the pen that God uses. But as I begin to research the type of pens they would use, it's pretty overwhelmingly the type of pen they would use is called a reed pen. A reed pen. A reed pen's actually been around uh, from almost the beginning of time. Uh, some, some scholars would tell you, and you've seen pictures probably of paintings uh, that people back in old times would use a quill pen. Yeah. Well, that's not what they would use during this time because a quill pen was not introduced until the 6th century. And we know the book of Romans was written between 50 and 60 AD. So we do know for certain that an amanuensis would have used a reed pen. The reed pens were first uh, used by the Egyptians. Actually, the Sumerians would use uh, reed pens, and then they, the, the Egyptians would use reed pens, but they would carve, use the reed pens to carve stone. But as time progressed, then they would take the same reeds and they would make papyrus, and they would use papyrus with the reed pen because the Egyptians figured out how to make ink, and so they would take that reed pen and they would dip it in that ink and write on papyrus. But then as time progressed and things got a little bit more uh, technologically savvy for whatever the Roman period was, they started using parchments and parchments were animal skins. So if my research is correct and I pray it is, I don't mean to, to 
throw you off or anything, but I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that an amanuensis in the time of Rome and in the time of Paul, Tertius would have used a reed pen writing on parchment. And parchments were animal skins. I know this probably to be correct because when Paul was nearing his crossing, he told Timothy, come before winter and when you come, bring the parchments. So t- <laughs> Paul wanted the word of God with him as he was passing. It meant something to him and no doubt Romans was included in that. And so as I was beginning to think about this, and and listen, if it wasn't for Tertius, think about what we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many people have been saved as a result of the Roman road? We would not have had that if it wasn't for Tertius. We wouldn't have and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We wouldn't have, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We wouldn't have, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We wouldn't have, therefore, being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We wouldn't have, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We wouldn't have Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We wouldn't have Romans 5, 8, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about what we wouldn't have if Tertius wasn't willing to be the pen. What I'm trying to tell you tonight, and I hope that you understand, you're missing out on being a blessing to so many others when you choose, if you choose not to be the pen, just to be the instrument that God would use. And so as I begin to focus on this pen, on this reed pen, as I've already told you about, he would have reused the reed pen and, and, and used it on the animal skins, parchments. I want you to notice some things about this pen. First of all, I want you to notice how it's created. I already told you that they, it was first discovered and they first used them in Samaria. Then the Egyptians started using them. And these reeds, again, we are the pen, right? So anytime I'm referring to the pen, I'm referring to you. These reeds, these reed pens are made from reeds and I want you to understand this, they're very common. There's nothing special about them. They're just out there. Actually, they would find them on the riverbank. But it's not just the riverbank, it's a specific part of the riverbank. To find the reeds, they would go to the lowest lying marshland that they could find nearest the river. They would go down to the muck and the mire. And they would go down there to find the reeds that they would use. Now to me, if I walk by the riverbank, if I'm fishing on a boat and I see some reeds, I'm gonna flip a frog in there, right? (laughs) They're just kind of, I don't see nothing but sticks. All I see is a bed for for bass to live in. But to the amanuensis, to the one, to the writer, to the artist, they see something that they can use. Hallelujah, listen, the world, hallelujah, would look at us and see just a useless stick. But I'm thankful God looks down and sees something that he can use. Down in that low-lying marshland, in the muck and the mire, and he would take a knife and he would go down to the lowest point of that reed and he would cut it off at, at, the, at the lowest point of that of where it meets the ground and he would cut it off. But it wasn't just, uh, they couldn't do it any time. They would use the reeds in spring and summer because they were more malleable and they would use those for the papyrus. But if you wanted to use a reed for a pen, you went and got it when it was cold, when it was the bleakest part of winter, when, it, when they were dormant, when they were hardened. That's when you you could use that pen. 
Oh, I don't know if I'm preaching tonight, but I feel like I am. I think I'm preaching to some people that just felt like a dead old dried up stick. But hallelujah, God came by one day and said, I see something in you that you don't even see within yourself. I can use you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And then he, then he creates it. He cuts it off. That's the next point. He not only creates it, but he cuts it at the lowest point. And when you first start, uh, I was, as I was researching this, my research led me to a master calligrapher. And he made this statement that I'll never forget. He said, a, a reed when it's cut is still a reed. But you never know how good a reed will be used for a reed pen until it's cut open. <laughs> oh, that's good, isn't it? So you never know how good this pen's going to be until it's cut open. Oh my, you say, Brian, what does that have to do with me? I'm so glad you asked. Sometimes the Lord allows us to be cut. Sometimes he allows us to be open. The Holy Spirit cuts through us and it hurts and don't feel good. But see, God sees something on the inside that he can use and you don't think it can be used, but he can make it all work together for your good. I've seen the Stiles family be cut open. And I thought, Lord, how in the world? How in the world? I tried my best to be strong. Uh, this is, I, I, we've, had, we've had a young man pass a, a few years ago under total different circumstances. And didn't really leave a testimony like, like AJ did. He had so much going for him. Boy, it cut. God sent the Holy Spirit and just cut us. And I thought, Lord, how, how, how are you going to use this? And he says, listen, I'm getting ready to do something not only in that family, but in that church. But it's going to take some cutting in order to get it done. I'm telling you, I hate it that we have to go through those things sometimes. But it's like the pruning process. God removes the things that don't need to be there. So it'll come away something stronger takes those reeds and he begins to cut away everything that don't look like a pen. Right. He cuts it away from the reed. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. There's some things that's hanging on you on. <laughs> that God's trying to cut off. Yeah. He's trying to separate it. Yeah. And listen, if, and I, know, I know it don't feel good. It don't look good. But listen, God's trying to transform you from a stick into a pen. And in order to do that, he's going to have to separate some things from you. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it consecration, sanctification, selling out. I don't care what you call it. Just get it. Right. You'll be surprised. Hallelujah. I feel the Lord tonight. You'll be surprised how much more God wants to do with life change. If life change would just be willing to be the pen and accept what God wants to send. Amen. Hallelujah. He separates and he shapes it. He begins to take his knife and form the tip. And then he shaves it. Gets it down to the finest point where he could be used. That pen, it's created and it's cut. But once it's cut, it's then clutched. What the calligrapher said is that the reed, of course, they can grow at several lengths. So when you cut them, they might be two, three foot long, one foot long, different lengths. So they got to cut it down. He said what they do is the calligrapher, the writer, or the amanuensis at this point, would measure the span of his hand. And that's how long the pen would be. That means at every point, from the the birth of that pen till it expires. It's always in the hands. Right. Amen. Woo. Thank God. <laughs> it's always in the hands of the artist. It's always in the hands of the author. It's always in the hands. Oh, I'm telling you what, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be in the hands of the Almighty. You can't preach without his hands. You can't sing without his hands. You can't teach without his hands. You can't be a good husband, a mother, of a son or daughter. You can't be a good, faithful Christian unless you're in the hands of the Almighty. 
And listen, once you're in his hands, there ain't no better place to be. You're clutched, always held in the hand of the rider. You're created, you're cut, you're clutched. But notice this, it's controlled. If you haven't listened to anything I've said, listen to this right here. The pen never controls the rider. The rider always controls the pen. It knows how much ink to give, the rider. The rider knows how hard to press. The rider knows how long to use. The rider knows when to re-dip. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Don't try to control the rider of your life. Doesn't the Bible say that God is the author and the finisher of our faith? He's writing our story. He's got the pen, which is us. And don't try to get ahead of the writer. He said, how does the pen do it? The pen is just submissive to what the writer wants to do. Tertius could not do anything He could not add anything. He could not take away anything unless Paul told him to do so. He was under strict guidance from the apostle Paul because if he messed up or if he did something extra or took it away, probably would have been punishable by death. So not only was his life riding on it, but his reputation and his job was riding on it. He was just submissive to what Paul would have him do. And listen, when are we gonna learn? The best place for us to be as a child of God is just submissive to his will. I know we just we just say this over and over again when it comes to around May, all the graduates that come across our stages, and we always say this same cliche: God has a purpose and plan for your life. And he does. But let me remind you. On February the 4th, 2024, God has a purpose and plan for every one of you. And guess what? His will is for you just to be the pen and be submissive to what he wants you to be. Our pastor, Brother Calvin Ray Evans, if he wasn't submissive to the will of God, he would have been a lawyer. That's what he wanted to do with his life. He had good grades. He could have done it. Probably would have made a good lawyer. Probably better than McCoy on Law and Order. But he was submissive to the will of God. Think about all the countless thousands, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying almost 80,000 people have come to Christ as a result of the ministry of evangelistic outreach, the ministry that he directs, if it wasn't for him being submissive, think how many thousands would be in hell tonight. Even in my own life, it's not all bad stuff. Not say lawyers are bad, but sometimes what I wanted to do was good. I wanted to travel and sing the gospel. I wanted to be in a quartet. That's all I wanted to do. I, I had a Nintendo growing up. Don't laugh, kids. It was great. I haven't had Pong and Pitfall and the original Pac-Man, so there you go. <laughs> Wore out my thumb. <laughs> but, but as a teenager, I watched Gaither videos. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like George Yance. I wanted to travel and be in a quartet and had, and had some opportunities when we were first married. I, I may have could have done it if I really pushed to do it. But God struck me down and said, hey, Do you want the Holy Ghost on your life or do you want to travel and sing? And so I learned really quickly just to be submissive. (laughs) Just to be submissive to the will of God. And who had a clue that I would be where I'm at today? 30 years this September, I've been sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I had no idea that God would take me from where I was to where I am now. Have I always been the best pen I should be? No, but hallelujah, I can tell you with all honesty, I've been submissive to the will of God. 
I didn't understand where he was taking us. I didn't want to leave Beach Fork and go to Rubyville, but God said go. I didn't want to make the decisions that I had to make, but I was submissive, and I'm so glad I did. I saw my son up singing today, and I thought, Lord, I just want him to be. <laughs> if I just want the be that you wanted me to be, think about where my kids would be today. Folks, I'm telling you, just be submissive. You're, he's controlling you, not the other way around. If you want to see your life mess up in a hurry, get ahead of God. Let him control your life. It's created, it's cut, it's clutched, it's controlled. But finally, I want you to notice this, the conclusion. The reed pen is, it's a pen now. But in its original form, Nick, it's still a stick. And it's not like those pencils that you can push and the lead comes out. Eventually, it's gonna to get to where it can't be used for writing anymore. And it's come to the end of its working life. Nick, I found out That master calligrapher said, what we do as master calligraphers with these reed pens is when they get to where we can't use them anymore and we've, we've shaved them, we've shaped them, but they're just too small. We, they're not good to be used. It's already done what its work is accomplished, but we don't throw the pen away. <laughs> we place it upon the shelf with the other pens that we've used over the years because we have so much appreciation for what the pen has been able to write that we put it up there as a display that whenever we look, we see what that pen has done. And even though it's work, physical work may be done, we still show its appreciation and it's not discarded. It's not thrown away. It's not forgotten about. It's there as a mentor to the other pins coming along that they can do something too. And they're not discarded. And I thought, oh my, oh my, I think of the, uh, the, uh, the senior saints, I love to call them, that they can't write like they once could write. <laughs> Amen. They may can't do what they used to be able to do, but thank God I'll never throw them away. <laughs> And I'm glad there's still some churches that won't throw them away. And now your, your ministry's a little different. Your work's a little different. You couldn't do what you once could do. But oh, I so appreciate the fact we have so many at Rubyville, and I know you've got them here as well. And I love to see them just sit back with big smiles on their face. Look at the other pins coming along. <laughs> and they're back here just, woo, go, keep on singing, keep on singing. We can't do what we once did, but we, we've done what we can do. And God says your work's not over. You just changed your occupation. And now you're a, a vessel that we can look on and say, you know what, if they can be used, I can be used to. Hallelujah. We were down, we was privileged to be in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and I wish I could say I got to enjoy the warm weather, but we went on a Monday morning and came back Wednesday morning, and in the meantime, we were in church, but that was all right. I still got some strawberry milkshakes. Somebody say, praise God. <laughs> I lost my train of thought talking about strawberry milkshakes. Anyway, so we were in, thank you, we were in Florida, and uh, we've been going down there, I've been going down there, well, since my daughter Abby was born. She was six months old the first time we went down. And periodically, I've been down there, but the last 10, 15 years have been privileged to preach there every year. It's a great, great little church down there in Tampa, Florida. And I noticed something this year that I hadn't noticed in years past. They've got some wonderful workers, extremely talented uh, musicians, a great song leader that arguably one of the greatest song leaders that I've ever been privileged to minister with. He just, Ron Duncan is his name. He just can get a whole crowd singing. But I noticed something, Dad. I noticed something this year with Ron. 
in the morning service where he would normally get up, he was pushing out some of the young people. And I noticed in the evening service where some of these great musicians that have been playing for 25, 30 years, like Tim over here, just amazed me how they can just get up and just do amazing things. I noticed they were sitting behind some of those young ones. They were pushing them forward. Amen. And what I noticed, I've seen that happen. I've seen people do that. But here's what I really noticed. When those young people were up leading the service, whenever those other young people were up playing the bass or the guitar, I saw the ones that had pushed him forward stand up behind him giving God praise and say, come on, come on, come on. We were in the prayer room with, before church like, like you all do here in Revival. And one of the, the old men that has led the prayer room for years, he's got cancer. Three years ago, they gave him 60 days and he's still living, still teaches Sunday school. Probably close to 50 years he's been teaching Sunday school. We came in that prayer room, Mick, and he said, guys, I got some great news. They tell me there's a young man that's gonna take my place. And he says, guess what I get to do? I get to teach him and mentor him and allow him to come in and take my place. And I thought, oh my, oh my, what a great testimony. Most of the time they'd be, well, they got some young whippersnapper gonna take my place. But no, they were behind him. The, the new pins were coming on. And it wasn't that the older ones weren't forgotten about or discarded. They were still being used, but just in a different way. May we always remember, all of us are replaceable. And you never know when the next day calls, you may be put on the shelf. So it's up to us as the pens that are now being used that we help these young, young pens that are coming along and encourage them. Because there's a day coming when I won't be around. Your pastor won't be here. And it's a terrible shame for a ministry in a church to die when the man dies. God help us just to be the pen. Be the instrument that God would use. I don't know if this has helped you tonight, but it sure has changed my life. It's allowed me to refocus and help me to be a better husband, a better father, a better uncle, a better brother. Somebody say amen. a better pastor, a better son. I just want to be used. But I can't tell him how I want to be used. I just got to be an instrument for him Amen. to use. Your heads are bowed.